In this video, we will do an example in which we show an equation has exactly one root. So the problem says, show the equation tangent inverse of x minus 2x plus 1 equals 0 has exactly one root. So there's exactly one x value that's going to make this function on the left-hand side be equal to 0. All right, so let's get into the proof. So for the proof, there's going to be two parts to our argument. We are going to first show that it has at least, at least one root. And then later, later we are going to show that it has at most one root, at most one root. And if we can do both of those things, show it has at least one root and at most one root, combined those would imply that it has exactly one. So that's going to be the structure of our argument. Okay, so for showing it has at least one root, we've done problems like this before in an earlier section. So I want to give you an opportunity to practice this. Pause the video for four minutes. See if you can show this has at least one root. Four, three, two, one. Pause it. Pause it and try it for four minutes. I'm going to give you a hint though. The key idea to showing it has at least one root is to use IVT, the intermediate value theorem. All right, pause it for four minutes. All right, let's talk about it together now. So I'm going to let this whole thing on the left-hand side be my function. I'm going to let f of x be tangent inverse of x minus 2x plus 1. And I want to show that this function equals 0. So to do that, I will need to be able, I need to find two numbers I can plug in one that will make this whole function be less than zero, one that will make the function be bigger than zero, because the intermediate value theorem will then tell me, oh, it's got to be somewhere in the middle, it's got to be zero, somewhere in between, as long as my function is continuous, and it turns out it will be. Okay, so let's start off by plugging in something simple. Um, so let me, let's try zero first. So that'll give me tangent inverse of zero minus two times zero plus one, Tangent inverse of zero is zero. And then we get minus zero plus one, which is one. Okay, so this output is bigger than zero. Now I need to find an output that will be less than zero. All right. So if I want to make the whole output get smaller, I think it's going to be helpful to plug in a bigger number for x. Because when I do the minus two x, I'm going to be subtracting a bigger number. Why don't we try plugging in one? because one is another nice value to plug into tangent inverse. Okay, we'll get tangent inverse of one minus two times one plus one. So tangent inverse of one is pi over four. We get pi over four and then minus two plus one, which is minus one. So let's see now. Well, we have pi over four, and I know pi is about 3.14. So when you divide it by four, this whole thing is going to be less than 1. And that means pi over 4 minus 1 is going to be a negative number. It's going to be less than 0. Okay, so we got our out. We got a number we can plug in to get a positive output, and there's a number we can plug in to get a negative output. Now we just need to make sure that I verify the conditions for intermediate value theorem. And in this case, since f, my function, is continuous everywhere, it's continuous everywhere. Everywhere. And that's because tangent inverse is continuous everywhere. This polynomial after that is continuous everywhere. And when you add or subtract two continuous functions, it's still going to be continuous. It, because of that, it is continuous on any interval we care about. And in this case, that is the interval from 0 to 1. Remember, for intermediate value theorem, it's got to be continuous on a closed interval. So now I say something like, okay, by IVT, by the intermediate value theorem, then I write the conclusion of it. There is a number, C, in the interval from 0 to 1, open interval, so it's something between 0 and 1, such that f of C will be equal to 0. I will get the output 0. So this shows that our equation has at least one root. There's at least one number c that's going to make our function be equal to zero. 
All right, so we are ready for part two of the argument. Now I want to show that I'm going to have at most one root. So the idea for this is going to be to use the mean value theorem and what's called a proof by contradiction. So proof by contradiction is a particular style of argument. So let's talk about, well, how does, how does a proof by contradiction work? Okay, so I'm going to underline this. So there's, there's three general parts to the argument in a proof by contradiction. So we'll start by assuming the opposite of what we want to show. Assume the opposite of what we want to show. And then the next step is we try to get a contradiction. So that means when we make that assumption of the opposite of what we actually want, we hope to show that that leads to something impossible happening. And we call that impossibility a contradiction. So if we get something like that, if we get a contradiction, an impossible thing, this means our assumption that we made at the start, our assumption is false. It's wrong. So if we assume the opposite of what we wanted to show, that means what we want, what we actually wanted to show is true or is correct. Okay, I'm gonna put this in a little thought bubble. Okay. So that is the gist for how a proof by contradiction works. Let's see um, how this works in practice now for our example. So I need to begin by assuming the opposite of what we wanna show. And what I want to show on this stage is I want to show that it has at most one root. I'm going to assume the opposite of that, that it has more than one root. So I'm going to suppose, I usually start it off by saying something like suppose for the sake of contradiction, suppose for the sake of contradiction. This is clearly outlines to the reader that I'm about to do a proof by contradiction. So suppose for the sake of contradiction that our function f has. So another way to say that it has a more than one root, that I'm going to assume that, is to suppose that it has at least two. f has at least two roots. Okay, so I'm going to call them a and b. So there may be more than two. I'm assuming that there's at least two, so I could definitely pick two of them and just give them names. I'm going to call one of them A, one of them B. So then what that means is F of A equals, well, to be a root of this equation. So our function is being equal to zero here. So to be a root of this, when I plug it in, it needs to satisfy it. It needs to make this function be equal to zero. All right. So when I plug it in, F of A needs to be equal to zero. And the f of b needs to be equal to zero. If we had had a different number on the right-hand side of this equation, like 10, then when I plug a into it, f of a would be equal to 10, and f of b would be equal to 10. It just depends on what my equation is. All right, so going back down to where we were, if I draw a picture of what we have so far, I'm going to draw some axes. I don't really know where a and b are, but let me just put a here and b here. What I'm assuming is that f of a is going to be 0, so that point is here, y value 0, and f of b is going to be 0, so that y value is also 0. I want to show that such a situation is impossible. So we said earlier that we were going to apply the mean value theorem. I need to first check the conditions of the mean value theorem hold, and if I look back to my function, this tangent inverse of x minus 2x plus 1, this function is going to be continuous everywhere, we already said that. And it's also going to be differentiable everywhere because tangent inverse is differentiable everywhere. And this polynomial is differentiable everywhere. All right, so I should just state that. So we say something like since 
since f is continuous and differentiable, I'll just abbreviate diff, differentiable everywhere, we can apply MVT, in fact, to any interval that we want. But in this case, I think it makes the most sense to do it to the interval from A to B, because I actually have information about those two points. Okay, so I'll put a colon here. So the mean value theorem says there is a number C in the open interval from A to B such that F prime of C equals, on the other side I gotta write the slope of the secant line, which is F of B minus F of A over B minus A. All right, so we have F prime of C equals, and we assume that F of B and F of A were both zero. So this is zero, and then minus, that's also zero, over B minus A. All right, the denominator is not zero, because we are assuming that there's at least two roots, so that lets us say that A and B are different. All right, in fact, maybe let's write that earlier. So when we called these two roots A and B, this implies that A is not actually equal to B. Otherwise, we would just have at least one root. Okay, so those two are different. All right, so going up to where we were, we have zero on the top and something non-zero on the bottom, and that simplifies to zero. All right, so we've gotten, we're getting that the derivative at C is zero. You might have noticed that for this argument, I used MVT, we could have actually used Rolle's theorem here. We could have used Rolle's theorem since, remember, there's a third condition for Rolle's theorem besides the continuous and differentiable part, and that was that f of a needs to be equal to f of b. And Rolle's theorem would have let us directly jump to the part where we said f prime of c equals zero. But in general, um, anytime I want to use Rolle's theorem, it's perfectly fine to use mean value theorem. Mean value theorem will just simplify to what Rolle's theorem says because Rolle's theorem is a special case of mean value theorem. Alrighty. Okay. So wh where I am now is I have the f prime of c equals zero. I want to try to get a contradiction. So I want to somehow show that this is impossible. So I'm going to show this is impossible. Okay, so let's take the derivative of our function actually. So remember our function was tangent inverse of x and then minus 2x plus 1. Let's take the derivative of this. So the derivative of tangent inverse is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And for minus 2x that's a minus 2. And then plus 1 that derivative is 0. And now let's just figure out, well, when is this derivative going to be equal to zero? Because earlier I know f prime of c needs to be equal to zero. So let's set one over one plus x squared minus two equal to zero. So if I move the two over, we get one over one plus x squared equals two. And now with this equation, I'm going to just reciprocal both sides. If I reciprocal the left, I get one plus x squared, and on the right, I'll get a 1 half. If you wanted to, like if you haven't seen the reciprocaling both sides before, if you wanted to multiply both sides by this denominator and simplify it, I could get to the exact same point. All right, now if I isolate x squared, we get x squared is going to be negative 1 half, and this is going to have no solution. At least no real numbers will satisfy this equation. There's no solution, because x squared is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. All right, this is a contradiction. Let me just write, this contradicts, what does it contradict? It contradicts the fact that f prime of c needs to be equal to zero. There's got to be some number that I can take the derivative of to get zero. This contradicts f prime of c equals zero. Because what we just showed is when we took the derivative and we tried to figure out when does it equal zero, we got that there's no solution. That means that it's never zero. 
All right, so once we get a contradiction, it follows that our assumption was wrong. That our assumption and our assumption was that f has at least two roots is false. And if that's false, then I can say, and so the opposite of that must be true. And so f has at most one f has at most one root. All right, so now we've shown f has at most one root. Earlier, using IVT, we showed that it had at least one root. If we combine those two pieces, we can now say, therefore, therefore, we have shown that f must have exactly one. It must have exactly one root. And that is what we wanted to show. So at this point, we are done with the proof. So I want to make one final kind of summary comment about this, which is that in general, if I'm doing a problem where I need to show an equation has exactly one root or exactly one solution, we want to approach it in these two steps. I want to first show that it has at least one root or solution using IVT. And then I want to show that it has at most one root or solution. And that involves, and that's going to involve proof by contradiction and mean value theorem.